Hi, I'm Andrew Armstrong, and welcome to the back office Teardown Lab. I have had, on occasion, to use digital means access control for entry into buildings, and this is one of those. And I thought it'd be interesting to go through them because they're generally, I'd say, uh, a medium level of security, maybe medium to low, and. I I'm going to show you why. I haven't looked into one of these ones before, these particular ones, but maybe they might impress me. Um, I did notice actually Big Clive uh, had a video on this, and I don't know if it's a recent video or an old video because sometimes I tend to catch up on people's stuff and it could be like out of date. Um, but let's see about this one. This, I, to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of, I'd say, generic, right? I can't even remember what it was called. It was on Amazon and they sold it as a RFID um, card um, panel with um, a reader with a panel but the bit that was slightly different on it comes with a rain hood so it's kind of weather weather proofed and there's a little gasket to go on that 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 part isn't really that interesting so we'll put that aside now the main issue I've always had with these is that they tend to be single unit which means all of the wires go into the the unit itself which obviously means if you can lever it off the wall, you could hotwire the device. Um, that being said, I'm holding this. That being said, this is surprisingly heavy. This is not uh, a typical plasticky one. This is actually quite heavy. Although I will say it just has a regular screw in the bottom that you might want to replace with at least a security screw to stop someone getting in there with a pen knife. Now, without looking at the instructions, I'm going to open it up first and, and poke around in it. The reason we will need the instructions, though, of course, is they always have a particular programming sequence and a default pin number, and obviously you don't want to leave them on here. First impressions, by the way, the buttons are actually quite nice. There's a lot of force behind these, although there is a little bit of jiggle, a little bit of Atari ST jiggle, which is okay in a keyboard, less uh, desirable in a keypad. <laughs> So the screw isn't captive as well, that's particularly annoying. So yeah, I will be looking out for some security machine screws. So you can see it's a cast back on that, that's actually really nice. I'd imagine if you can get good fixing onto the wall and uh, there probably is room to put a washer on there too, that you're going to get a pretty decent amount of purchase on here, even if someone's trying to lever this. It's going to be a while before that snaps off. And to be honest with you, they're putting that much effort. Uh, you know, you kind of think you're just delaying them from getting in at the end of the day anyway, aren't you? Um, you have an anti-tamper here, look right there. I'll zoom in so you can see how that works. It really, all it does is just touch the back of the panel and if it opens, ding. And I always wonder if you had a smarter system, perhaps down the line, you could have a second box that would detect the anti-tamper and just remove this from the circuit. But the, the problem the problem you have um, when you look here, though, that's, that's really it, where you probably have the open switch or door one. One of these will be connected directly, and that's when you put the code in, it will actually activate that. In fact, you can see there, there are those relays there. It will normally be relay activated. Um... I think I'm slightly interested enough to want to go in a bit further, but we'll have to be a bit careful here because there are some small wires that we can see that will be coming from its RFID antenna. I've undone the screws and we don't want to damage that RFID antenna, so I'm going to be very cautious and just push this board over to the side. Standard membrane uh, keypad fair here. But it does have some nice LEDs here, which means it is illuminated, and they go through these holes here into a light guide, and that's pleasant, very pleasant. I'm just going to take out one of the buttons, seeing as it wants to come out. It is a plastic button, and <laughs> I'm just wondering to myself which way does that go around? Is that a 6 or a 9? Mm, I'm guessing it's a 9, so we're going to put it around that way. The bit that always interests me is looking at here, you've got contacts for those relays and power, the various pins this device uses scattered around. And I'm always intrigued whether or not you can defeat that by going through the front of the unit. You do have this front edge here, so potentially if you could lever out some of these buttons with some heavy pliers, you could get to them, but then you do have to go through this light guide. So I'd say from just a frontal attack, it's probably okay. 
Um, if, if you were trying to really bust in here, you're probably better off trying to get through just by levering it off the back. So I think we'll put it back together and power it up and just see how it reacts. It'd be interesting to see how complicated or easy it is to set it up, especially with these RFID tags. Looking at the instructions, these do have quite a lot of complicated modes. So I'm just going to turn it on. You can see it powers up, LEDs on. And you have to pay quite a lot of attention to the book because you can configure this in quite a few different ways. You can have it keypad only, card only. There's a programming mode, there's a user mode, and they are indexed. So that means if you issue a card, for example, with a three digit number, so you could write them on the back or maybe use the last few digits of this as a, as a note in your you know, inventory, um, you can actually delete specific cards or tags from the system. So it's kind of important you know, if that's your use case. Otherwise, you're going to have to delete all the tags when you have an issue. So I'm going to go into the programming mode and it says press hash 881122. Two beeps. And then we're going to enroll a new card. So we're going to press 5 and I'm going to start them at 0, 0, 1. So then we'll just present the first one. So that's, that's 1, 2. I think I'm only going to do 3 because otherwise we'll be here all day. And then when we're done, we just press the hash again. So that's taken. Yes. And I heard a click right there. I don't know if you could quite hear it. I'll just be a bit quiet as we do it. Good, that's a good job actually, <laughs> nice and easy. And we'll take a tag that isn't registered. Let's see what happens when we try that one. It doesn't like that at all. An interesting feature is that you can have something called a private pin, which allows you to assign a four digit pin number to each fob. That requires you then to enter the pin number and the fob at the same time. Well, I say same time. You present the fob and then you have two seconds to start typing in the pin. Obviously, you have a standard public pin. That's one pin for everything. And the default for this is allegedly one, two, three, and four. There we go. And we're in. So you've got to be careful with these defaults. If you just set it up for using fobs and you're never going to use the pin, please still change the pin. Now, it does have a mode on it that you can configure for that sensor. So let's see what happens when we try to open it as default. It didn't seem to do anything. So we're now open. The spring has clicked. And it still lets us in. I have set the anti-brake mode on this now. So once we open it, it should do something different. And it does. It makes an annoying noise. It doesn't necessarily stop you getting in there, though. But at least it's something. Just as a double test, I've gone through every card, I've labelled them all up, I've programmed them sequentially, so you just start with one and two, three, four, and it will automatically increment that index if you're doing a batch, which is great. They all worked open as normal. I then went through and did a batch delete, so I set it to delete and again presented them one after another till it was done. So now if we take any of the cards that were previously programmed and run them through, you can see it flashes green briefly to show that it's read it, but it doesn't allow entry. It clearly works. And if you're interested, research these because they do come with a specific power adapter that doesn't cost too much money. It's a mains line adapter, but it has all of the different features that connect directly to these. So it's got a built in timer and several power sources. They're designed to operate those magnetic or door release, uh, magnetic door release locks, you know, the two different kinds the kind that glue the door shut and the kind that operate that buzzer bzz thing. Um, so I'd always recommend going for one of those because these integrate directly with that. There is a doorbell button on here and of course there is doorbell output. You'd have to double check on that but it is probably a relay operated one as well. You'd have to look into it. Now the bit I'm more concerned with is its weather protection because if you leave one of these outside for any length of time it's going to get wet and you can see you've only got minimal protection here and that protection is just a lip. So water ingress is a likelihood. Um, maybe not to the circuitry looking at this, but it would run all the way around it and possibly corrode the whole thing. 
I can see there is some small gaps potentially here that might act as a channel. I think those two there are the drain channels. But you really are going to want to put it into something a little bit more significant. I'm just going to add the screw in the bottom. Again, think about getting a security screw for that. Or if you're, if you're really particularly abusive, you can do a, one of those one-way screws. If you never want to take it apart again. But I wouldn't advise that unless you're pretty happy levering the whole thing off your wall in the future. So it's just a cowl. Uh, with a lip and you saw there is a gasket that does stick onto the back in fact i don't know why they just don't stick it on but they probably leave it off so you can drill all the holes and pilot holes first so you don't damage this i think that would actually be a really good quipe seal and then this thing fits right in underneath there and it's not designed to give it protection from attack because clearly you could break that off although it probably gives you a little bit but what's really great as you can see from the profile is that unless you've got some really significant driving rain it's really not going to get in or around that too much you know don't hit it with a pressure washer for prolonged pressure washing but for just general weather i think that's a really nice hood and that's going to protect it from sun and rain so there you have it if you're interested in access control you've got a gate or a door or a garage you know you want to automate this could be a way of going about it rfid and pin and it's nice and simple and i know you're saying oh but we're living a day of wi-fi i promise you if you go start trying to look out for a semi-commercial system so something a little bit more advanced than your standard ring or amazon doorbells that will do the door locking and give you wi-fi and give you a camera you'll find the market doesn't really have too many things on offer you need to start doing a systems and engineering approach and that's exactly what i'm doing here and this is one aspect of it as ever thanks for watching by the way, if you're really concerned about somebody levering this off the wall and getting to your wires, what you could do, and I, I would advise this, is potentially put a Lucas type connector or a bullet connector in the cable where it's in the wall and make sure the cable on the other end is clamped so that if they're pulling on the cable, it will disconnect. A top tip.